Good morning, and welcome to NeoConnect 2020. NeoConnect is NeoCon's online series of resources, programming, and events held throughout the month of June. I'm Monica DeBarlo, NeoCon's Program Director, and I want to thank you for joining us. Today's session is approved for one CEU credit for interior designers, one LU credit for architects, and one GBCI credit for lead professionals. It is also being recorded so you can access it on demand. Please refer to your screen for more details. We begin the week with the session, Attributes of Contract Furniture. In this session, our speakers will discuss eight key attributes of contract furniture, aesthetics, quality, craftsmanship, safety, performance, health and wellness, sustainability, and verification. They will explain the influence these attributes have on the decision-making process for furniture manufacturing. And they will discuss the role of certification schemes and other evaluation tools to verify each attribute. Our two distinguished speakers include Jennifer Womack, the Director of Outreach for BIFMA. Located in Grand Rapids, Michigan, Jennifer works directly with the influencers of the commercial built environment. She is the organization's brand ambassador, communicating BIFMA's message as the industry leader in developing furniture safety, durability, and sustainability standards that ensure product performance and inspire confidence. Martin Flaherty is the president of Pencilbox Inc. located in Atlanta, Georgia. Martin is a communications and strategic planning consultant who has worked with a variety of corporations and industries, including the Coca-Cola Company, GM, and Aflac, as well as startups, NGOs, and commercial furniture and flooring firms. He has developed both strategic and tactical plans that have affected measurable change in the world of commercial buildings, architecture, and design communities. He is an authority on sustainability, brand management, corporate social responsibility, and ESG communications. And in July next month, he and his partner, Ken Schmidt, will launch the podcast, So Let's Discuss This, conversations with presidents, CEOs, and leaders discussing the world of business. Please welcome Jennifer Womack and Martin Flaherty. Well, thank you so much. Monica, um, we're really excited to be with you guys today. Let me just share my screen here. Great. We are here to talk about the attributes of contract furniture. I am Jennifer Womack with BIFMA, and let's go ahead and just launch right in. So Monica mentioned um, the CEU capabilities. I uh, wanted to just give an, an extra plug around GBCI. If you need your lead AP or your well AP credit, um, this course can satisfy that. I would encourage you to go ahead and maybe take a screen grab here um, to note this course number, because as you know, you need to self-report that. So um, this is just an additional thing that is open to you if you like. All right, well, here are these eight attributes that Monica mentioned. Um, we're gonna go through these in some detail and we'll sort of um, be moving around in and out of a few of them because what you'll see is that they, they very much interrelate and overlap. So what we're gonna start with, um, all good CEUs have learning objectives, right? Uh, this one is no exception. So this first one really is around this notion of making, and this is where aesthetics and quality and craftsmanship really come into play. We're gonna talk about the importance of authentic design. We're gonna talk about um, construction techniques and uh, industry standards, safety and performance. We're gonna hammer pretty hard on that. As we work our way through, then we're going to get into um, a whole section on health and wellness, recognizing how does furniture impact that? How does the furniture in the environment um, have an effect? Uh, chemical exposure is a big part of this conversation. And then kind of dividing it up, um, sustainability, of course, is a very large topic. So we've sort of divided it down into health and wellness. And then in this section where we're focusing more on planetary health, our sustainability section, we'll talk about the different attributes that are often associated with this 
and just help you to um, kind of understand what to look for in your evaluation and so on. And then finally, we'll round out with the verification, um, the different tools that you can use to help make those good decisions and help you have more confidence around them. Okay, well, starting off with aesthetics. Um, you know, arguably, probably the least objective of the eight attributes that we'll be talking about today, but we do think it's really important to, to hit on this, this notion of authentic design and the importance of that. Uh, this quote here from Grant Featherston may, may not be a design person you're that familiar with, but he and his wife were mid-century modernists, um, unlike another more uh, well-known duo doing design work in that same time period, the Featherstons were working in Australia. And I think this quote really speaks to this notion of the intent behind design, that good design is not, um, and I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here with the majority of the audience out there, but it's not necessarily making something beautiful alone. That is part of it, of course. But it's the functionality. It's making sure that it's properly um, designed for the use, um, for the application, all of these things. The design intent uh, really then has an impact on safety, durability, things like that. So, so when we find ourselves in a situation of um, having knockoffs or um, replicas in the environment where, where those same design and engineering sensibilities aren't part, you know, aren't sort of baked into the product in the same way they are with uh, original design. You just open yourself up to um, all kinds of potential risks uh, and just, you know, not um, sort of appreciating the uh, original design that was part of the design intent. So here are three awards that can help um, sort of verify, if you will, again, in aesthetics, uh, this is more subjective. But I think with all three of these awards, and we could have put others up there, but these are three pretty uh, common ones in the North American furniture industry, you'll see that some of the criteria listed in all three of them. And I think it's really interesting um, to note some of that. Uh, you'll see sustainability in various forms mentioned. Um, all of these awards lean heavily on design innovation um, and, and aesthetics don't stand alone. So some of the things that, that I love um, on the Best of Neocon Award, you have this notion of the contribution to the built environment. So we're not just creating stuff for the sake of creating stuff. There has to be a contribution there. Um, for the HIP Award, I think we have a statement here that really reinforces the, the quote we just read from Grant Featherston when we're talking about you know, the pioneers' achievement, achievements in product design, just really that intent behind. And then with the Red Dot Award, which if any of these are less familiar, this may be the one, this is an international award for all kinds of products, but there are some furniture categories and, and the qualities you see here are some of the criteria related to those furniture categories. Um, that, that one at the top of the right-hand column um, around this self-explanatory quality, which to me really speaks to this notion of human-centered design. So there is criteria and there are things by which one um, can make some assessments around aesthetics. Moving on to quality and craftsmanship, um, let me point out, because I didn't under aesthetics, on the bottom of your screen, you have some helpful wayfinding. As we talk through these different uh, subjects, well, again, we'll be kind of in and out of the conversation. And so to help you orient, okay, what are we talking about? Sometimes it will be obvious here. We're obviously talking about quality and craftsmanship, but, um, but there might be other times where you're not sure sort of the subject category. So that's just a helpful way finding you'll see throughout the presentation. On this one, uh, the things we really want to highlight is the importance of materiality. Um, material is everything. And um, manufacturers of professionally designed products engineer their furniture and they understand this notion of inherent material properties. They'll, they need to have respect, right? Not every material is right for every application. Materials have limitations, they have appropriateness, and we'll be talking about some of that. Um, so I think it's fair to say that materials literally make the product.
This is a quote from a veteran of the furniture uh, manufacturing supply chain. And I think this speaks to what we've been talking about as well, that it emph emphasizes that um, this notion that furniture that is made and assembled in a high quality factory setting is really important. Uh, this goes a long way toward determining the ultimate performance of that piece when it's actually in use in the field. It's gonna impact the quality and the craftsmanship, um, the process controls, the repeatability. Again, we, in, in a commercial setting in particular, we wanna make sure that the furniture uh, performs in the same way every time, over time, and what you buy today or what you buy tomorrow or next year is gonna have some of those same, um, those same attributes. So this really rolls up uh, into the confidence, confidence for the person specifying, for the person making the purchase, and then ultimately, of course, for the person who is utilizing the furniture uh, in the field. So what makes a high quality product? Um, in the case of wood, we're gonna camp out on wood for a few slides because it is such an important material for our industry. Um, looking at different joints here, um, there's no one right answer. I think that's important to say. Um, in a lot of time, you know, a lot of cases in life are like this. Um, but it, it's really a matter of the right joint is gonna have to do with the design aesthetics, it's gonna have to do with the particular type of wood, the material selection, with the machinery capabilities of the manufacturer. Uh, but just pointing out a few of these, um, I will say that dovetail and butterfly joints, this is the one in the upper left and the upper right hand corner, um, aren't as uh, commonly used in commercial settings, those tend to be joinery that's used in more artisan um, type furniture applications. And this really has to do, um, there's some cost factors with it. Uh, most of the manufacturing um, kind of machinery doesn't necessarily lend itself to doing these kind of joints in commercial settings as much as some of the others. But you might see that. But all of the others here, um, dowels, butt joints, mortise and tenon, miter and rabbit joints are all really um, very viable options for joinery techniques and you will likely come across potentially all of these. The important thing is that the best joinery technique is gonna be the one that meets the commercial safety and durability standards and the one that that specific manufacturer is really set up to run day in and day out. That's where their process controls are gonna be in place, going back to that quote that we had from Doug Britton. So continuing to look at wood, because this is such a crucial material, um, let's start with all natural solid wood. There are um, some really wonderful things about solid wood. Um, obviously it's, it's strength, it's durability, it's just a, a beautiful material. It has sort of an inherent beauty that most everybody can really appreciate. Um, the fact that it's uh, a solid wood is a uniform material can also really help simplify the process from a sustainability standard. Um, its environmental impact, its end of life strategies can sometimes be simplified whenever you have a product that is made out of a, a singular material. It just makes sort of that end of life, what do I do with this? You're not having to unsnap or unzip multiple materials. So solid wood can be really helpful for that as well. Uh, other parts of the sustainability um, you know, profile we're gonna get into more deeply, uh, but certainly this would be, that end of life strategy is gonna be based on assumptions that it's sustainably harvested wood and that it wouldn't have been finished with um, you know, harmful chemicals or have harmful um, VOCs, volatile organic compounds with it. But it's not necessarily the right material in every application. And so this is the important thing. Um, solid wood tends to be heavy, and that may not be right for, um, for your purpose. Maybe you're shipping it a long way or something like that. It also can bow um, and sort of sag if it's not properly reinforced. So again, this may not be the right uh, material for certain long spans and things like that. So it's just really important, again, that respect for the material, for what it can do in various applications. Applied woods is another format um, that is often used. Uh, and so applied woods can either be what 
some people would call the A surface, as you're seeing here, where it's the surface itself, it's what you're seeing. Sometimes plied woods are also what you might call the B surface, the sort of inside, um, inside of a frame that might then be fully upholstered or something like that. But this is made by um, taking various plied layers of wood and laying them up um, and then adding glue and pressing them to adhere. So the bonding process is critical, the heat involved is critical, the pressure, um, the tool that's used to create the shape, these are all of the critical manufacturing uh, methodologies that need to be in place and need to be repeatable and so on. Um, so it's really important to dial those in appropriately for the piece uh, to make sure that, that over time you don't have splitting or cracking or things that could impact the integrity of it, could lead to um, not only um, aesthetic problems with it uh, not looking right, but then also could, in, in a severe case, actually lead to safety issues where the piece no longer has the strength and integrity as designed. Real wood veneer uh, is the next thing we want to talk about. Um, veneer refers to thin slices of wood. I think a lot of people are at least somewhat familiar with veneering. Again, not uh, somewhat similar to plied woods. There's a sense in which it is uh, glued and pressed onto uh, this, in this case, a substrate, a core of some kind. And um, the design capabilities with veneering are really um, vast. And so that's part of the reason why we have a lot of veneered woods. You can do a lot with different species. You can lay it up in a whole, you know, we could have a whole CEU on veneer and different layups and different ways of cutting wood and so on. So there really is a tremendous amount of design capabilities inherent with real veneer wood. As we look at some of the considerations, um, it is uh, a highly specialized skill, <laughs> laying up veneer. The selection of the wood, the laying it up, the gluing it properly, um, these are all really critical parts of the craftsmanship and something that um, doesn't have that know-how will often show up in, in some of the more vulnerable areas like the corners, the seaming, and again, maybe over time, things could become delaminated or things like that. Um, so there can be uh, cases where, you know, uh, a poor quality wood veneer could um, really start to look shabby out in the field and um, may not cause the, you know, uh, catastrophic failure of the piece itself, but certainly um, reflects the, uh, the look of the product in the field. Switching gears now from wood, um, we'll briefly touch on a few others, foam and fabric in this section. Uh, foam is a complex issue and we could talk for a long time about it. We won't, we just have this one slide to touch on it because it is such an important material. Again, um, because the right foam in commercial furniture is critical. And because of the rise of a lot more lounge and residential, uh, collaborative and we spaces in the commercial environment, we have a lot more foam as a result of that with, um, with the increase of more fully upholstered pieces. So it's really important that that foam is durable and appropriate for a commercial setting. This is um, often a case where the kind of foam that is specified that might be appropriate for a residential setting oftentimes is not appropriate for a commercial setting. And this is where things can start to fall down when products aren't um, designed for a commercial setting and end up there. There basically are two main types of foam uh, in terms of overall ways in which foam creates a shape. The first one is called slab foam. And so it's, you know, comes in various thicknesses, varying densities, there's a lot of variation the manufacturers can can get their hands on so that they can really, again, kind of dial in those properties around the amount of firmness they need or the thickness and so on. So slab foam can, can be um, very helpful in um, the manufacturing process and usually you're cutting it, maybe gluing it together to create a shape. The second type is actual molded foam. So um, you're utilizing a tool and you are molding the foam in the exact shape that you need for that particular piece of furniture. A little less um, 
uh, so, you know, tighter, tighter controls on the types of foams that will lend themselves to the molding process. So you may not have as many options of the appropriate densities and so on. Um, and then there's also costs associated with that because you are investing in a tool. So again, it's not that molded is better than slab or vice versa. It's the application and the material and, and really working with the manufacturer asking the questions. Um, but making sure that it's foam that has been appropriately designed for, you know, work. Um, whether you're in a work environment, in an education environment, in a healing environment, the furniture is intended to, um, to provide something that's different than what would be in a residential environment. Fabric is a really key area. Um, it in, a, in much furniture, it almost makes the product, right? It's the first thing that people will see often in a chair, certainly in a fully upholstered piece. So it's, it's very critical. The Association for Contract Textiles is the organization um, that is, works with fabric, with the fabric manufacturers and their supply chain. And as you see here, they have developed these uh, performance guidelines that can become evaluation tools and um, all fabrics that have gone through this usually list this, if not on the hang tag itself, you know, certainly available on a website or from the manufacturer. So some of these things are probably pretty self-explanatory in a way, um, you know, flammability obviously doesn't meet the necessary um, flammability requirements for that particular piece of furniture. Color fastness has to do with um, the ability to not fade in light. Crocking is one that might not be a super familiar term to everybody. Uh, they have two tests for this, a dry crock and a wet crock. And basically that means does the color rub off like on your pants, which is what you would not want in the case of seating. So there's this whole array, um, physical properties has a couple of different tests, whether it's pilling, seam slippage, um, some uh, overall breaking strength. So there's just this whole array of things um, and abrasion obviously being a really important one, which is um, surface wear in different settings. So really critical. Um, one thing that I think is, a, is good to mention um, about fabric because it might, it sort of goes against what you might think common sense would be. A lot of times you hear, oh, you get what you pay for. And to some extent, you know, that can be true with certain things. Um, in fabric, that is not always true. Um, the cost, in the sense that the cost of fabric does not necessarily imply the performance. In other words, a more expensive fabric does not equate with necessarily um, a more durable fabric. So that's where these evaluation tools are really important and really critical. A good example of that, just to give you some context, you know, imagine 100% silk fabric is gonna be very expensive because of the, the fiber content but it may or may not be as durable as, you know, a more, a less expensive, even polyester or nylon, for example. So again, really important to, to be looking at these performance requirements. So now talking about safety. Um, hopefully you're becoming somewhat convinced that um, quality may not always be something you can see on the outside. And so what we have here are, um, are some lists of, of one of the BIFMA standards. Um, we've taken this from our chair standard, which is our general purpose office chair, and just listing you know, the array of things that are tested for in that standard. Um, you know, you'll see a bunch of things that talk about durability, a bunch of things that talk about strength. And so we're testing for all of these different things. Um, what you have to know about is that the reason we have tests is so that a product can be, um, can be shown to be safe before it hits the market. And it can be safe not only on day one, but you know, maybe on day 2000 when it's entering its fifth plus year of service. So in a commercial environment, this becomes increasingly important because lots of different people might use that product. Um, it might be moved around in the environment. Um, you know, there's just all kinds of things that um, could lead to the wear and tear. So the standards are really developed to simulate that wear and tear in 
what would be expected for the use of a chair or a table or a piece of storage. But also there's a lot of stuff in the standards that test for sort of unexpected use. <laughs> How often have you sat on the arm of a chair? Well, the arm isn't designed to be sat on, but we all know we do it. So there are tests for that to make sure that arm strength, you know, holds up, things like that. So it's just really criti critical um, that organizations who are serious about selling products into commercial environment really invest in the proper testing um, so that the stuff will meet the standards and they don't expose themselves to unnecessary risk. And we're gonna talk about this a little bit more over these next couple slides. Here's a couple of marks that can be helpful to you. Uh, marks of assurance. The background for BIFMA, uh, Monica introduced me as being with BIFMA. This stands for the Business and Institutional Furniture Manufacturers Association. So, um, our primary members are the furniture manufacturers, and we do a lot of different things. Uh, but one of the big ones that we do, and the one that most people know us about, is actually creating the safety and performance standards for the industry. What you see here on the right is the level mark. So that is our third party certification standard for our sustainability standard. And on the left there, BIFMA compliant, this is a new program that is in, in development now that will launch uh, in March of 2021 that will cover all the rest of our standards, all of the safety and performance standards that we're talking about here. So why is this important? Um, BIFMA standards, they, they foster value and innovation. Uh, the standards don't tell a manufacturer how to do their product. They just tell you how it needs to perform. So that is not something that should be um, up for debate. So this allows a level playing field for the manufacturers providing furniture into commercial environments to not compete on the basis of safety, but instead to compete on the basis of all the other things um, that might be of value to you and their customers. So let's talk about a few of these things. What can happen if you don't test to a standard? Now, I'm not here to say that, um, you know, nothing that has, or every piece of furniture out there that has not been tested to a BIFMA standard is gonna have a catastrophic failure in the field. Uh, I'm absolutely not saying that. I'm also not saying that something that has been tested to a BIFMA standard will never have an issue. But I think what we see is what we don't, what we don't see are catastrophic failures in the field with products that have adhered to a standard. And this quote here from um, an industrial designer working in, working in our industry sort of speaks to that, um, that there is a troubling trend of products that are hitting the market, which haven't been tested. And we're starting to see um, more, more product failures and in the worst case scenario, they can lead to safety concerns, they can lead to injuries, um, and this is really a tragedy. Here's an example where uh, we go back to materiality. The standards do test for materiality. In this case, we have a particle board that obviously did not hold up to the task which it was intended to do out in the market. Um, now, if this product had been tested to a BIFMA standard, there, there are things, if, you, if your product uses a fiber board um, component, there are all kinds of tests that say, you know, um, is it, uh, does it have a certain strength? Is how rigid is it in different atmospheric conditions? What is the uniformity of the board? Um, the holding strength of screws, that, could have been helpful in this case. So that the, all of that kind of stuff is baked into the standard. Um, in this case, probably the standard for storage would be the appropriate one for a piece like this. So um, the products really have to be um, engineered to function as intended out in the field. And adhering to the standards um, really help us to know that that is happening. Our purpose here in this conversation is not to, um, you know, is not to highlight any particular brand or to throw anybody under the bus. It's really just to highlight uh, the importance of 
the standards again, but stuff can go wrong. And so here's an example um, of a product that was in the market. Um, it actually had so many problems and so many failures that it was removed from the market uh, back in 2017. But unfortunately, the manufacturer of this product had a pretty big reputational hit as a result of that. Um, so, you know, legs were literally falling off as people sat in these things. Um, and it was just a poorly constructed product. Now, you know, that is something that would have been discovered in the testing process. And so one of the important things too about testing to a standard is the fact that the manufacturer has the opportunity to identify where there might be an area. I mean, they're trying something new, they're being innovative, they wanna test and make sure. Maybe they find that they have a weak point that they weren't aware of. It allows the opportunity to address, to re-engineer, to perfect those things before it hits the market. So that's hey, one of the really, yeah. Jennifer, can I jump in there? There's a question Please. that was just asked by one of the folks out there, a woman by the name of Ashley Snipe. And it says, in regards to safety and performance for BIFMA testing, are there different stages during the design build that the product gets tested? Wondering if the chair has to be fully engineered and built before it's tested, or if it's tested as it's being designed mm -hmm. uh, or prototyped before it becomes uh, an orderable product. Oh, that's a great question. Um, all of the BIFMA standards are full product standards. They're not component, uh, like, so somebody couldn't say, oh, my caster adheres to a BIFMA standard because it would have to be the caster on that particular chair with that mechanism, et cetera, et cetera. So they are full product. Um, the tests are all full product tests. However, um, within the standard, different test methodologies are pulled out. And so as the manufacturer, uh, the design engineers can look at some of those particular test protocols and say, okay, this is the one that is, you know, testing for the base, let's say in this new chair. So um, they can sort of simulate some things to do some early, um, sort of early prototyping, early intervention, um, what we hear from most of our members is that when they're doing a brand new chair, you know, they obviously have a whole series of prototyping. And so they might do some testing on some of those early prototypes. But um, yeah, it is a full product test. Thanks. Great. Thanks for the question. Warranties is another helpful tool that um, can help signal the intent really of the manufacturer is it's a warranty you might say is as the slide says here an indicator of the manufacturer um, what they think themselves about their own quality uh, can sort of be uh, surmised by the length of the warranty what we've pulled out here is an actual you know warranty from a BIFMA member it is not an unusual one this is very usual and customary that you you'll see for commercial furniture so you see, you know, there's a 10 year lifespan, the BIFMA tests do um, the standards all pretty much utilize this 10 year basis for setting durability tests. We have a, a few that have five years, but um, that's kind of the, the intent is that a product is gonna be around for a while and it needs to continue to function in service, um, function in service in, in that way. So warranties can, can be a helpful, um, a helpful tool to use um, for that. So this section has been pretty dense. Um, we've talked about a lot of different things. This is just kind of a, a roundup slide to show you a little bit of good, better, best. Um, again, there aren't things here that are necessarily always gonna be good or always gonna be bad. Um, in the absence of asking more questions, of understanding that manufacturer, what their capabilities are, um, and then looking to things like warranty, to having passed a BIFMA standard, these are some of the things that, that you can do um, to help you have better confidence about, about what you are specifying. So with that, I will pass things over uh, to Martin move my people out of the way. Let's see, I hope you are all seeing this. I'm yep, gonna... looking good, Martin. Wonderful, excellent. All right.
All right, so as Jennifer had said, it's now my turn. And she said that what, uh, what she had handled earlier was a little bit dense. So we're gonna deal with health, wellness, and sustainability, which are completely light and totally easy to understand. Um, I, uh, ha, ha, ha. But the good news is, is as we start looking at the attributes of commercial furniture, there are these whole collections of incredibly arduous and difficult issues. What has been really positive is through work from NGOs, the various different trade associations, as Jennifer has highlighted, in collaboration with environmentalists and other folks, there has been this aggregation of content into a more simplified way in which you can start looking at product and looking at the application of product in buildings. And I'm sure most of you all are familiar with those things. So we're going to cut this up into two things primarily. We're going to talk about health and wellness, and then we're going to move into a section on sustainability. But as opposed to going into into a lot of the human health related issues on health and wellness. One of the things that I really want to focus on is more aligned, uh, aligned with how it applies to materials and the application of materials. And then how do you figure out verifications and certifications that correspond to judging uh, the, uh, the value and, and how you should be looking at these particular products. So we're going to look at primarily indoor air quality, uh, referred to as IAQ, material safety, and also ergonomics. There is a whole host, as you see on the screen, we're going to touch on a lot of these things, but uh, we're going to really put the emphasis on those other elements. So when we start looking at IAQ, for those of you uh, sort of have been in the uh, industry for a while, or perhaps know your history a little bit, this comes out of the whole issue related to sick building syndrome. When you remember back in the times, there was this whole affliction people were beginning to experience inside of the office, and it was quickly understood that it was actually the materials inside of a building and how tightly wrapped the building was that caused these VOCs uh, to then create exposure and people had negative reactions to them. So BIFMA put forward uh, the creation of a standardized test that gave them the ability that put it out into the market that then allowed you to understand and measure what VOCs were. So the idea here is controlling these common uh, indoor pollutants. And then the idea is around a verification process so you can understand what is taking place here. And so you now begin to see the creation of GreenGuard and also SES's indoor advantage. What is really important is looking over on the right hand side. It's not to make everyone learn the legislative aspects to all of this, but if you could take one thing away in understanding the issue of IAQ, always understand what California 1350 is looking at. That has become sort of the gold standard of legislation and requirements around what is acceptable product that would then meet that standard. So you wanna make sure that whomever it is that you're looking at or whichever standard you're looking at incorporates and uh, acknowledges 1350 as part of it. Shifting over, we then say, okay, so it's, you know, things are made up of things. I know that sounds silly, but chemistry is this fundamental part of it. And there are two ways of understanding chemistry involved in products. And the objective here is to really to look at and understand the whole idea of what is, what are the components that go into a product and then evaluate and assess them for whether or not they meet a criteria. So the two most obvious uh, 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 pardon me, uh, transparency tools out there are the HPD, which is the uh, health product declaration. And then there is Declare, which comes out of the uh, International Living Futures group up in the Northwest. Both of those require a chemical disclosure application, whereas the evaluation tools that are readily available to you to sort of look at quickly is to say both cradle to cradle and level take into account that information within their certification standards. I suspect a lot of you just staying in the, in the realm of chemistry are familiar with the issue of flame retardants. This is a huge issue. Stemming from the late 60s to early 70s, the whole issue of uh, people being injured or dying within fires uh, brought forward this idea that the California legislator put in effect called Cal 133. That was this thing where you could introduce what were considered at the time sort of safe-ish, but quickly learned that they had serious uh, human health factors involved with them. And that was the whole flame retardants. And so what happened was, is, is it was a good idea with unintended consequences associated with it. So when they put forward the legislation, 
pretty much everything had to have fire retardants in it. Commercial furniture was certainly part of that. We're going to talk about that, but if you're, it's fascinating to look at. It moved into clothing. It looked into all sorts of other applications as well. The point is, is that legislation requiring the, chem the introduction of chemical flame retardants into products has been moved away from. California has rescinded that. The trade association, BIFMA, as well as ACT, and as well as a number of others are applauding that move and been supporting uh, the move away from that as well. When we think about wellness also from a standpoint of the human factors, ergonomics is core. We've read all the books like smoking, uh, sitting is the new smoking, you know, your chair is killing you, all sorts of hyperbolic phrases that are out there. So really the idea of the creation of an ergonomic guideline is to provide guidance to those people involved in the manufacturing of product, simply to go ahead and reduce fatigue and also discomfort in the product design phase. It's not it's not requiring people and mandating them to do it. We've all sat in a bad chair. We've all sat in a good chair. We know those factors well, but this is a built out way in which people can go ahead, pull the standard, the guideline in and incorporate them. It's so well understood and recognized ISO, the international body has got two evaluation tools out there. The most common one though, that is being used in the commercial furniture industry and in general, not just in the US but across the world is BIFMA ergonomics guideline. That's sort of a base standard or a base guideline to understand the application of that. I'm sure a lot of you all are familiar it look at the well building standard that was created in, uh, well, it went live in 2014. There are over 1100 projects right now going through that building standard. The, the idea and concepts around it is to look at the places where we live, the places we work, the places we learn, they are supportive of human health and well-being. It is, a, it is an aggregate that is really more focused on the individual. And again, but pulling back into it, the way it applies to what we're talking about with contract furnishings, if you look at material section here, it's really looking at what we talked about earlier. It's about VOCs. And then by reducing and managing those things, it's emission control as well as that, not just within the materials associated with VOCs, but also within the building itself. The reduction of hazardous materials. And so there are things like design for environment, there are things like material selection that are thought of by manufacturers as they go through the process of designing a product that they want to remove those out. And then what are the better alternatives that can be considered? So this is uh, the, the well building standard supports uh, material, um, better enhancement of materials. So now let's dive uh, a little bit into the world of sustainability. We're really talking much more on the product end of this, but there's some really important distinctions to understand. So we're gonna run first on the left-hand side, looking at product sustainability considerations and then corresponding evaluation tools. The idea here is really to go ahead and give you a shorthand by looking and understanding what these visual cues are, what these icons are, you can begin to say, okay, if I see cradle to cradle, if I see level, I know that this is an aggregation of a variety of different things. So we'll go through them. So climate neutral materials is exactly that. These are looking at materials that have either reduced or meet climate neutral goals. All of these systems go ahead and account for those. LCAs, um, a life cycle analysis. So each of the three that you saw in the first one uh, support life cycle analysis as well. That process in which you look at the complete picture of the product, not just from cradle to gate, which is when the product is born, to then ultimately when it is pushed away from the factory, but you're looking at the issues regarding end of life. What's new in this factor is that the folks at SCS have developed an LCA test that a manufacturer can go ahead and provide independent of any of these others as well. Efficient use of materials is exactly that. It's rewarding or supporting how material is used. One of the smart things to look at is even if you're looking at a company that is producing product right now that isn't using one of these things, 
by diving deep and understanding, are they using the lean processes involved in the manufacture of product? Lean requires a high level of efficiency, so there's less waste and there's more maximization of materials. So there are, while we believe firmly in looking for a standard, even if you can't find one, lean and knowing a company is following those methodologies, they're using and optimizing uh, and maximizing uh, material usage. Bio-based and renewable materials are, are sort of a thinking about um, materials mostly from the, the world of the natural world that exist and can be grown and harvested within a 10-year window. So wood falls out of that, although there are elements in the wood family, sorghum reed, bamboo, that fit within sort of what would be considered a bio-based and renewable material. Those are all accounted for, as you're seeing. You're seeing some repetitiveness that Living Product Challenge, Level, and BIFMA account for those. Uh, recycled content, though, where SES has stepped up again, and we've got a separate certification that can be found Found, and that can be used for evaluating a product. If all you're looking for and all of your client is looking for uh, is recycled content, you'll be able to find that in any one of these. Um, as Jennifer was talking about earlier, this whole biodegradability and recyclability, these are accounted for across all of these standards. And a thing to note in all of these standards is these are multi-attribute standards. And what, means, what I mean by that is they take into account factors beyond just the product they take into account the manufacturer, so the corporation that is producing it, are they meeting standards from a standpoint of uh, safety and worker welfare? Are they then meeting manufacturing requirements? Have they done energy tests? Have they done water testing? Are they meeting the safety standards required in responsible manufacturing? And then ultimately, how does that then manifest itself in the product that's being created? So you're able to weigh not just a product, but you're able to go somewhat up the channel and see how the company has behaved. Because the question becomes, can a green product come from a brown company? And that's a challenge. We also look at extended producer responsibility. So a lot of things that used to be in manufacturing and used to see this be pre-world when we really didn't think about recycling. Every time a product was pushed out from a manufacturer, the onus was on the end user to figure out what to do with the product. And inevitably, as Jennifer pointed out, with bad products, typically they get pushed off to the curb and thrown away in landfilled. There is a, now within these standards is an ability to understand of like, um, extended product uh, producer responsibility. Solid waste management is a massive, massive issue because basically what's happening is, is landfills are getting filled. Um, we can always build, dig more holes, but it's not a good application. And then water management, um, the effective use and management of water. Again, old days, bring water into a plant, go ahead and use whatever you needed and then pump the effluent out. Water management requirements are now all part of these standards and you can look at a manufacturer and look into the certification to see how well the manufacturer is behaving. Also within thinking about a uh, product in this, in this larger way is the end of life issue. Uh, BIFMA has been working, uh, the folks at uh, a couple of different manufacturers have been doing a really good job at trying to get a handle on how much uh, waste is being pushed out there. But what we're looking at is figuring out how do we qualify in the product as it moves from the manufacturer into the end user's hands, that there is an end of life capability around it. So reclamation or take back or even a leasing option is a possibility. So when we look about common materials, there's some shortcut ways in which you can think about this as well. There are a number of different wood standards. FSC is a standard that actually takes wood all the way down to the forest that they're extracted from. It's called chain of custody. Other wood standards don't incorporate chain of custody. Chain of custody looks at things like how are the people being treated that are, who populate that area or who are tied directly to that forest. Um, we really encourage the use of highly recycled metal content when available. There is a huge global scrap market available in metals. Some are more recyclable than other, but high recycled metal content is the smart thing to be looking for. Plastics need to be considered strongly as well because not all plastics are created equal. There are plastics that in their creation have massive environmental implications and the downcycling aspect of them is problematic. And what I mean by downcycling 
recycling is, is when you take the raw plastic and reintroduce it into the system, you then have to introduce more virgin material to stabilize it. So you really want a, a plastic that has higher uh, reusability and benefit to it and is more benign in its production. Uh, Jennifer was talking extensively about the whole textile world act has gone ahead and produced something called FACS, which then provides a whole level of screening to certifications as well. So when you think about uh, CSR or now what's ESG is evolving, you wanna understand that there are responsible aspects to the manufacturer and their behavior, just as a way it looks at the corporate social responsibility of an organization, as do these other standards. A lot of other standards that are single attribute do not account for social justice or social responsibility. And as we move into this whole process, it's like, okay, so how do, we, how do we aggregate all of that into thinking about this? And the whole idea is around verification. And as Jennifer made earlier, as we go back into what are the attributes of contract furnishings, great ways to look at it. And it doesn't necessarily mean that if people don't win one of these awards, it's not a viable product, but these are just really solid measures in each of these awards. Uh, quality, we're gonna introduce some new ones in here. If, if, and again, as I said, it, it depends on what your drivers are. Um, there are standards, there are certifications out there that can help you with that. So on the quality front, um, you're seeing these three uh, elements that are there. ACT is taking a huge step forward on that. Um, craftsmanship. Hey Martin, yeah, go. Can I just, um, one of the questions that um, just came up and I answered it, so now the person's name disappeared, but others may have been having some of the same questions, which was about the fact that designers often um, need to purchase their furniture sight unseen. And so, yeah. you know, what, how do they know when they can't test out the ergonomics themselves or things like that? So, um, these kinds of verification tools that we're going through here now are some of the some of the really helpful ways that you can you know get some of that confidence that you might not be able to you know if, if you've never seen the product so yeah and 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 it, it's there is a publicly available site uh, that Bifma has put out there that has all of the level product uh, that is available that has gone ahead and met. Uh, these requirements. And you can search in any category of furniture or product. And this is not just from some of the huge brands that you know of. There are over 4,000 products that have met level certification and you can find them. Just a, a small bit of a shill thing. Level is the largest um, uh, it is the largest multi-attribute sustainability standard that accounts for these things. Not, not necessarily quality, craftsmanship and such, but all the environmental concerns. So at least you can filter your uh, environmental needs through that. Cradle to Cradle also is a great method. They are sitting around 500 products certified. So then we flip over to safety. Um, in safety, uh, BIFMA has created standards throughout its 48 years of being in business. There is a program that is coming out called Compliant, which is next year. Jennifer, do you want to speak a little bit about Compliant? Sure, yeah, I mentioned it very briefly before, and this is another one of these sight unseen, um, because whereas some of the things around aesthetics that we've talked about, or even environmental, you know, your client may or may not you might, you know, not be getting a lead certification, et cetera. But when it comes to safety, you know, that's sort of non-negotiable, we would say, for a commercial environment. Hopefully everybody can agree that safety is needed. So this BIFMA compliant program will allow you, um, when it launches, a very quick way, similar to the level database um, registry that Martin was mentioning a moment ago, we'll have a BIFMA compliant database. All of this is readily accessible from the BIFMA website today. Um, where you'll be able to search all of the products that have been, that are in the program, uh, and that means that they have successfully passed the, the relevant BIFMA safety and performance standard. So for right now, the best thing to do is ask, you know, ask your rep, ask the furniture manufacturer um, if they have tested their products to the standards to make sure. Um, and, and this is and this is part of the really really big difference that exists um, because w what you have is if you can find these marks if you can find these filters 
and, and this is incredibly complex information, it is a shortcut for you. This is the big flag. If you cannot find product that at least has some semblance around this, then you're gonna need to start asking yourself questions and start digging. And time is a huge factor in the ability to really, um, when you're aggregating a whole bunch of products for a job, can you really spend that much time doing that? So these are shortcuts. So we look at performance, uh, similar to safety, same three players are looking at testing that and providing certifications around that. Uh, in the category of health, and wellness. The shortcut, you're seeing a whole series of other players out there that are really, and again, this is a recorded session. You'll be able to access it, but you'll be able to see what these marks are and how they contribute. Sustainability is huge. There are other sustainability uh, standards that are out there, but not all sustainability certifications are the same and not all of them measure the same thing and with the same level of breadth and depth. So finally with verifications. And then Jennifer, why don't you take us home? Yeah, thank you. So um, we raced through a lot of stuff here, but um, just to kind of summarize, why don't we just go to the next slide, Martin, if you would. Some of the things that we've been talking about, um, actually, you know what, uh, this is a slide build. So I'm gonna go ahead and take back control if that's okay. Go Hopefully for it, I'm gonna stop it. sharing. Okay, all right. Pull this up. Means I'm going to have to keep away my questions. Thank you for bearing with us here. But so working at home with only a laptop and not two screens, something is always covering the thing that you want. There we go. All right. So again, this is kind of what we have been talking about today, and hopefully um, you're becoming convinced and uh, ha I've been able to answer a lot of the questions that have come through um, as we talked about the aesthetics, the quality craftsmanship, you know, hopefully this, the importance of authentic design as it helps, you know, to kind of carry that design aesthetic all the way through into things like quality craftsmanship safety and performance, obviously, a lot of that is about design intent, right? Um, what is the product intended to do? Is it designed appropriately? Has it been engineered appropriately, et cetera? So very interrelated. And then this really huge area that Martin did a bang up job of trying to run us through health, wellness, and sustainability. And then finally, these verification tools, which is that shortcut. We recognize uh, the importance of shortcuts to people who don't have a lot of time. And so um, when you can turn to the experts, that's always really helpful. Um, and we've hopefully shown you a lot of good ones. So just, um, yeah, kind of looking again at, at what we talked about today, uh, really looking at making the product and all of the things that go into that, what, you know, what ensures quality. Looking at the health of the product. Uh, what is the impact on the end user who's going to be living with this stuff over time, but even also what was the impact on the people who, who made the product in the supply chain? Most of those multi-attribute uh, standards address that as well. And then the planetary health throughout the whole supply chain as well. And we looked at some of the specific materials that are used very prevalently in our industry. And then finally, the verification. So we just want to give a shout out to some of the folks who helped us, some of the experts who provided um, their know-how and some real world context to some of these things. Uh, we're very grateful for them. And then, yeah, we want to thank you so much. We do have a few minutes, it looks like, for some questions. Uh, if we still have some, let me pull up some of the Q&A here. You see that, um, our contact information is there, both myself and Martin. So feel free to reach out to us if we can be of any further assistance. I know some of you were asking some a little bit more technical questions about like ISO and things like that. Um, so I can certainly get you, um, if my simple quick answer didn't, didn't get you what you need, um, I can get you hooked up with the experts at BIFMA who can go deeper into some of that stuff. Yeah, in general, I'd like you to send all the hard questions to Jennifer. And things like, do so she I can like, pump them to someone else. Yeah, yes. Do I like ice cream? And the answer is yes, I do. So you don't even have to ask me that. 
Yeah. So one question here from um, Darcel is, is it possible to find a catalog um, of all guidance? Um, I wouldn't say there is one catalog where everything we've talked about today um, is in place. So, uh, you know, looking at some of these different programs, they all have websites and, you know, give you some overview and so on. Um, being a BIFMA person, I can speak to BIFMA. We try to put some good resources on our website in terms of like a one pager that describes each of the standards and sort of what they cover and what's in them. Um, kind of a user friendly, we, we do have some resources like that when it comes to those. Uh, question here about cost. We did not discuss costs. Budgets are tight right now with projects. Do you have any suggestions of how to lower costs but still durable brands? Um, one of the things that I probably should have mentioned is, so we talked about, you know, the cost of materials and so on, but um, sometimes people think that if something is tested to a BIFMA standard, it must be, that's only the expensive stuff, you know, um, and that's really a misnomer. Because again, you know, safety hopefully isn't, uh, isn't an optional thing. <laughs> so we would say that be, something being tested to a BIFMA standard is really, you know, the level playing field that, that all commercial products should adhere to. So within things that have been tested to a BIFMA standard, there is a wide array of price points, um, a wide array of aesthetics, a wide array of materials, of manufacturers, you know, there's just... Um, a huge amount of products out there. Um, so at the moment, until we have our BIFMA compliant up and running, there's not, you know, one place you can go to see all of that. Um, but I would say talk with your rep, talk with your manufacturer, ensure that their products are tested, and then, you know, have that discussion about things that might meet the budget of what you need. So I think that kind of rounds us up. So I will... Um, Turn it back to you, Monica. If there are any unanswered questions, again, feel free to reach out. And just a huge thank you for allowing us this time today. Jennifer and Martin, thank you for that very important and enlightening presentation. Uh, we really appreciate your sharing your expertise with us today. And thank you to everyone for joining us. Please join us tomorrow for product, product, Proactive Leadership and Future Proofing Your Business. Have a great day and be well.